Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Malcolm Maestrell and I'm a membership services coordinator with IAAP. Thank you for joining us for today's subject matter expert webinar, how to perform an accessibility audit. Before we begin, we have a few general housekeeping items to go over. Closed captioning is provided. To enable closed captioning, select the CC icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen. The stream text links for English, French, German, Spanish, and Swedish will be posted in the chat as well. American Sign Language interpretation is also provided. Microphones are muted to prevent any background noise or disruptions. And we ask that everyone please post your questions in the Q&A. The chat will also be monitored for general dialogue and technical issues. And today's webinar will be recorded and available in our webinar archives. And we will send out a copy of the recording and presentation to everyone who registered. And now I would like to turn today's program over to our presenters, Giacomo Petri and Michele Lucini. Thanks for the introduction, Malcolm. And uh, hi, everyone. As presented by Malcolm, today's session will focus on how to perform an accessibility audit. In order to do some context settings, uh, let me uh, introduce the uh, company Giacomo and I work for. Uh, our company is called UsableNet, and we have been pioneering digital accessibility for over two decades and with more than 1,000 engagements and offices in uh, New York, Austin, and the Northeast of Italy, where we are broadcasting from. We support uh, a number of different industries uh, in the space of uh, retail, um, travel and hospitality, technology, education, financial services, healthcare, in building their accessibility program. Couple of words also around Giacomo and myself. I am Michele Lucchini and the vice president for delivery. I've started in usable net 23 years ago, and uh, I'm really glad for the opportunity that uh, we are today to present uh, our, uh, our vision of uh, how to perform an accessibility audit. Together with me today, uh, I have Giacomo. Uh, Giacomo is the director of our accessibility auditors. And with that said, I think that we are good to start. So let's start reviewing the together the, the agenda. We'll start focusing on some foundational concepts just to set the background of uh, what we are talking about what is the environment uh, re that relates to an accessibility audit, trying to define its complexity and how articulated it is. Uh, then we'll discuss about which are the preliminary steps when we approach with our companies uh, the accessibility audit in terms of needs, goals, and uh, objectives from, um, for an audit. We'll review together what we should expect from an audit, and we'll then dig into probably the core of this session, which is the differences between an in-use audit versus a code audit. And then we'll, we'll definitely leave some space to, to Q&A, so to question and, and answers. So let's start with some foundational concepts. In order to better identify the, the topic, uh, we need to start from the basics. And when we talk about an accessibility audit, the basic is represented by the Web Content Accessibility Guideline. In its version, uh, which is the de facto standard right now, the 2.1 AA. Uh, I don't want to go into um, crazy details, um, but it is important that we first uh, realize what is the structure. The guideline is organized in principles. There are four 
perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. Each principle has a set of guidelines that needs to be respected, 13 guidelines in total. Each guideline has a set of success criteria to be met. And we are talking about 50 uh, success criteria in total for the level double A, as I said before, currently the standard when we talk about digital accessibility. The success criteria are organized in three levels, uh, single A, double A, and triple A. The reason why we are presenting the, the structure is to highlight the complexity or the, uh, the way it is uh, the web content accessibility guideline is articulated. The, the, the guideline is complex. If we just think about all the uh, sets of success criteria and techniques that an auditor needs to adopt in order to be able to verify if something is satisfied or not. The, the way it is organized represents the only possible way to make it usable for, uh, for an accessibility expert in order to produce a report. So accessibility and digital accessibility, it is not necessarily something very easy. It is something that requires uh, an articulated process because of its uh, natural complexity. As a second foundational concept, it is important to uh, refine the language and the semantic. Uh, so what is an accessibility audit? Uh, in these 20 years of experience, we have seen the word audit being used to represent a number of different deliverables. So today, we'll give you our point of view on what an accessibility audit is and why we believe uh, it is uh, what we think it is. So an audit is an assessment of a digital property against a standard. As we said, the standard is the Web Content Accessibility Guideline in its version 2.1 AA. As we are doing an assessment that is going to measure the conformance against the guideline, this implies that we need to verify all the success criteria, including the guideline, which immediately means uh, that just an automated tool, it is not enough to validate the entireness of the guideline. And it is necessary, necessary, necessary to combine assistive technologies during our test. With assistive technologies, we, uh, we mean all the uh, tools, software, and hardware that um, are required in case of different abilities. Examples of assistive technologies could be screen readers, screen magnifiers, and uh, so on and so forth. When it comes to do an audit, there are a set of preliminary steps that we highly recommend to consider. First of all, the goals. If I'm a company that fills the needs of an accessibility audit, it is important that I'm very clear with the reason why I need an audit. Do I need an audit, an accessibility audit, just because I need to know where I am? was the health from an accessibility point of view of my digital properties? Or do I need to do an audit in order to be able to generate a voluntary product accessibility template, which is also known as VPAT? It is a, a common documentation that is often required to, uh, as an assessment, an official assessment, to share with other companies around the accessibility status of a digital property? Or do I want to do an audit to highlight exactly what, which are the violations because I have in mind a, a program to remediate all the accessibility violations and improve the conformance level of my digital property? Obviously, these goals can be combined are not mutually ex uh, exclusive, but it is important to start with the reason why I need an, an audit. 
because the reason drives in many cases the approach for the audit do i need a quantitative audit we, we, and with this i mean do i need a high volume of pages to be audited or do i need a qualitative audit so just selecting a representative sample of my website so i can focus on the common violations and i can better uh, define a remediation strategy which matches with the definition of the scope do i need a large scope to be audited or do i need a representative uh, sample to be audited it might seem to somebody uh, these are trivial aspects but i can guarantee that we have seen many companies struggling because they were not clear with their goals so often they've been overwhelmed by the results of the audit or the audit was not enough to mm, perform the actions that they plan to uh, to activate after the reception of, of the audit. When we talk about accessibility, uh, another important aspect is to identify actors and languages. Accessibility speaks different languages, and uh, uh, this means that the way I um, talk to about accessibility to a developer, maybe indicating what uh, actions needs to be taken at code level, is different than the way I'm discussing accessibility with a stakeholder, where maybe I need to stay more at an higher level discussing conformance, legal risks, uh, um, strategies, planning. It is important that we recognize the different languages so our message is consistent and is appropriate across different teams because something that probably you have already learned is that accessibility cannot be just a one team responsibility. It is a topic that involves uh, a lot of different actors and departments in your organization. So questions that we might want to uh, ask and ideally answer when we are facing accessibility audit is who is going to analyze the audit and take decisions? Um, we need to consider that when we do an investment uh, doing an audit, uh, there are at least two expectations that we have. First one is that the information contained in the audit will be presented in the way that fulfill our needs. Does it report what and uh, satisfy the goal that we had uh, that drive the, uh, the need of the audit? Is it clear to understand? As I said before, accessibility can be potentially complex. So we want to have an audit result that is clear to understand. Understand to do what? Understand to take actions. And actions can be a very broad um, goal. Uh, so actions very specific, very granular in what to remediate and how to remediate. An action could be how I can do my release planning, start starting to incorporate some accessibility remediation. So do I have the information in my audit on prioritization, for example? So these are all related to languages and actors that are involved uh, uh, in, into an audit process. So what to expect from an accessibility audit? Uh, first of all, I want an audit to be comprehensive. I want an audit to report conformance. And I want an audit to provide parameters to determine who needs to do what, so identify the responsibilities, facilitate and potentially drive the prioritization, and support the definition of a remediation strategy. Uh, I, I know I'm. I emphasize multiple times the importance of a plan or a strategy, and this is fundamental when we um, we talk about accessibility because 
simply reiterating a development or design like I've always been designing and developing, followed by an accessibility testing. And then I go back to the design and development table, I remediate and I keep iterating this process will make accessibility not sustainable and too expensive for everyone. So the idea uh, behind uh, the my words strategy plan are all focused on try to learn from initial an initial remediation can that can be originated by an audit and try to define an accessibility program so accessibility is sustainable. In other words, what I can learn from an audit beside the specific remediation to transform accessibility from a project into a requirement for all the teams that are involved into the digital property I'm now focusing. When we uh, talk about conformance level, and here you see just an example of one of our audits, in, you have, for, for example, the indication of what's the conformance level, a legal measure, how many success criteria have passed and how many have failed. Then you have the classification of the issue by check type, which are the issues that have been found, that can be found and discovered in a fully automated way, which can be found uh, mixing test automation and manual verifications, which are the ones that can only be found with a manual activity. Just to set some expectation, less than 5% of the success criteria of the web content accessibility guideline can be tested fully automatically. Uh, and of course, this probably rearranged the expectation of many persons uh, on how much we can rely on automation uh, when we when we do web accessibility. The reason why we believe that this information that you are seeing here is important is, for example, for managers or the legal team to measure the potential exposure. The, the legal industry is often is relying on uh, test automation in order to uh, check uh, websites and potentially sending uh, send a claim. So if I know how much of my accessibility violations can be only found uh, simply using an automated tool, that might help us with some uh, prioritization strategy, or like I said before, that could help me just measuring my legal exposure and my, my risk. In other parameters that we believe is fundamental is identifying the uh, a classification for the responsibility. I mentioned before, accessibility is not a one team uh, focus. There are many departments involved and there are issues that are at code level that are responsibility of the development team to resolve. There are other issues that can be at design level. So it is time for the design team to find a solution and many others that can be related to the content. So not design, not structure of the site, but pure content. With this classification, it becomes immediate to understand which are the main actors, which are the doers for the remediation and would simplify a lot the distribution of, of the work across our teams. I mentioned before the importance of parameters to define a prioritization. Two parameters that we use and we recommend are severity and complexity, where severity measures the impact of an issue on the final user experience. And complexity is a parameter that indicates how complex the resolution of that violation might be. So, for example, uh, a company might decide to concentrate on the low hanging fruits, which are the issue, issues with a, an, easy severity, an easy complexity uh, by a um, high severity. 
it is all part of the of the strategies and uh, when it comes to what the doers who actually needs to remediate uh, needs to receive from an audit they need an audit to be actionable so clear indication of what needs to be done as accessibility very often it is a new topic for the majority of the people that are involved for the first time in, in a, an accessibility remediation an audit should also provide education do, do not underestimate the importance of understanding why something has been a, a trigger as a violation of the guideline just focusing on resolving something without actually understanding why that thing is an error might have a, a, a consequence probably a, some regression in the future so if the team doesn't, doesn't understand why something has been reported as an error most likely that error will be introduced in the following releases uh, you should expect from an audit to receive instructions on how to resolve in one word you should expect an audit to be a tool to accelerate your remediation and education process a couple of examples uh, always considering uh, our audits just to, to provide you a, a demonstration on what we believe uh, should be an audit um, one of the actionable item is uh, for example the ability of identifying components so recurring elements across the scope that has been audited so it is easy to also organize the work and identify which are the most recurring issues that potentially are in the two components that are in this example either in footer which are present you know, on every single page an audit should provide the list of all the issues that are present in a in a page and again details here are not fundamentally important we'll review a couple of details with with Giacomo in a few minutes but the importance of listing everything so the comprehensiveness with the with the guideline I mentioned before an audit should provide education so having a description of the issue and the solutions so people can learn while they work on the on the remediation and where the issues are particularly complex the audit should provide the instru instructions from the person that conducted the audit on what is the recommended solution so now we want to spend uh, some some minutes focusing on the difference between an in-use audit so a, or an audit that is originated by using a digital property so in our example an audit uh, that can be generated by an activity of using a website so browsing a website with a variety of assistive technologies versus an audit that is also that also includes a validation of the of the code so of the html css and javascript code which are big drivers of the final accessibility and conformance of a website do you want to do you want to kick on okay. sure thanks mate <laughs> okay guys uh, what does an e-news audit mean an e-news accessibility audit consists in an evaluation process that assesses a website or web digital product against accessibility criteria, in our case, against the WCAG Web Content Accessibility Guidelines requirements. It involves conducting a series of tests, including the usage of assistive technologies and emulating user behaviors to simulate real-world usage scenarios. The metrics to measure the status of the website consists in in-use metrics, such as uh, the time, the number of mistakes made, and so. The primary goal of an in-use audit 
is to identify accessibility issues that arise during actual usage of the website or product. So it identifies issues in use in a sort of empirical way. It is important to note that an in-use audit may not always pinpoint the exact cause of an issue. While it might highlight the presence of an accessibility problem, it may not provide detailed information on why the issue exists or the underlying reasons for its failure to meet the web content accessibility guidelines. Directly connected to this point, although an e-news audit can present accessibility issues, it might not provide explicit solutions or recommendations for addressing each specific issue. The focus of this type of audit is primarily on identifying barriers and gathering empirical data, which can serve as a foundation for further investigation. In summary, um, an in use audit is an evaluation approach that examines a website or digital product in action using assistive technologies to identify accessibility issues. However, it may not capture all the accessibility barriers and often does not provide information about the source or the solution for these issues. In this slide, uh, we showcased a concrete example of an in-news test conducted using VoiceOver and Chrome. This slide displays a product details page from a retail website, specifically highlighting the quantity dropdown. When interacted with using VoiceOver, the element is announced as one quantity menu pop-up collapsed button. All the necessary information required to understand the element appears to be correctly configured. The label quantity, the current value one, the element type menu pop-up button, and even the state which is collapsed, everything seems all appropriately conveyed to assistive technology users. This observation gives the impression that the element's accessibility implementation is remarkably well executed. Likewise, when testing the same component with a different combination of technologies, in this case, NVDA and Firefox, NVDA announces the component as quantity combo box collapsed one. The information presented may vary slightly between the different technologies. Each technology may announce the element in slightly different ways, but you know that users are familiar with their respective technologies, including the terminology and the order of, of information provided. In this case, the input label is clear. NVDA says quantity. The element role or type is identified as combo box. The state is indicated as collapsed and the current value is appropriately presented as one. Great, again, everything appears to be working as expected. The quantity component seems meeting our requirements. Now let's see what a code assessment brings to the table. In our usable net code audit process, the in-use audit represents the last step of the process specifically designed to validate and confirm the findings identified during the code assessment. During an accessibility audit conducted by UsableNet, the auditors follow a structured approach using the UsableNet Aqua platform. The audit starts first performing a comprehensive code assessment, which entails analyzing the code base against the WCAG, so the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, this assessment um, aims to identify the root causes of accessibility failures and determine the most effective and robust solution to address each specific issue. The, the code assessment is a crucial step in the audit process as it enables the auditors to pinpoint the source of accessibility barriers and provides valuable insights for the remediation efforts. By identifying the cause of the problems and proposing appropriate solutions, 
the code assessment significantly accelerates the remediation phase, ensuring that accessibility improvements are implemented efficiently and effectively. In the upcoming slides, uh, we have included screenshots of our usable NetAqua platform to demonstrate its capabilities and highlight what we consider necessary to provide during an audit and what represents um, a real game changer while performing the remediation. In these screenshots, we will revisit the same previous example of a retail product details page featuring the quantity dropdown. This time, the page has been recorded and analyzed using usable, usable Net Aqua to assess its accessibility. Previously, we had evaluated the quantity component and considered it to be in good shape. However, the screenshot presented now reveals the true accessibility state of the quantity component when assessed using Usable Net Aqua. Upon the evaluation, Aqua identified an issue with the quantity component as indicated by the issue description, which is form control doesn't have an accessible name. Now let's delve into the various sections of the usable NetAqua platform while exploring the accessibility issue in detail. One important component of the Aqua platform is the dynamic and interactive preview of the web page. This preview visually highlights the specific accessibility issue, which is in that case, the quantity dropdown. This feature provides a comprehensive visual representation of the issue, allowing users to easily identify and understand the accessibility concern within the context of the page. Another crucial component is the navigable DOM tree, which allows auditors and developers to traverse through parent and ancestor elements, providing a comprehensive understanding of the page structure. Additionally, we have a tab panel that offers developers access to more detailed information about the current element and its accessibility properties. This includes a code inspector where code can be reviewed, CSS properties, an assistive technology preview, which emulates the behavior of a real assistive technology, filtering the page by specific elements type, and so on. Upon interacting with the code view, it becomes evident that the quantity dropdown lacks an accessible name. This is due to the quantity label not being neither explicit, explicitly nor implicitly associated with the dropdown element. Specifically, there is a div element containing a span element with the quantity text inside, followed by a select element without any accessible name. Finally, the issue details section provides a concise description of the accessibility issue, including its severity, which represents a metric to understand how impactful is the issue for the end user, its complexity, an estimate of how difficult will be the remediation for, of this specific issue, and the responsibility, which highlights the teams involved into the remediation phase for this specific issue. It also offers a detailed explanation of the issue, along with potential solutions to address it. To, to summarize, during the e-news audit, the quantity component appeared to function correctly, but Aqua has identified an accessibility issue. This might lead someone to say, okay, even though you are saying that the quantity input is currently failing from a WCAG standpoint, it doesn't seem to be affecting the end user at all. Both VoiceOver and NVDA users were able to recognize and understand the element properly. To address this ob observation, let's take a look at the screenshot demonstrating the behavior when using Joe's with Chrome. Joe's announces ConvoBox 1, and that's all, where ConvoBox indicates the role and 1 represents the current value. There is no information about the accessible name of the element. When using Joe's, 
it becomes difficult or even impossible to understand the purpose of the input. In summary, it is important to emphasize that while an in-use evaluation may not always reveal certain issues, they can be detected through a code assessment. This highlights the significance of conducting a code assessment as part of an accessibility audit. Okay, um, we, we only have 20 more slides left and then we are done. No, I'm joking. I, I promise this is the last one. And then we'll open the floor for questions and answers. I see there are uh, some questions. Um, why did I include again the initial screenshot of usable net aqua, which let's say sh showcases all the features we have previously discussed? Upon reviewing the previous slides, I would like to shift the focus to, to the remediation process. The code audit is intended to accelerate the remediation phase. The responsible party for remediating the accessibility failures has all the necessary information conveniently consolidated in a single dynamic view. This is what you should provide within, a, within an audit, which basically reflects what Michele previously said. We should have something that is actionable by the teams responsible for the remediation. We should have something that allow to educate these teams from an accessibility standpoint, and then something that provides instructions on what is the cause of the issue and how to solve it. This kind of feedback provided during an audit plays a significant role in accelerating the remediation phase and acts as a game changer for the next steps. Great. So thanks, uh, thanks, Giacomo. Um, I see that we have uh, a few few questions that I think are very helpful to probably better explain uh, the, the core of this section. I would like to start with the with the answer that I already provided in the in the chat in in writing. Um, at some point uh, uh, at the slide 24 that I, I'm going to just uh, show again very quickly. We mentioned the importance of simulating user behaviors. And the question was, isn't simulating user behaviors more about usability testing and not conformance testing? Both are important, but I know that it is typically more about conformance to web content accessibility guidelines isn't it? And not, uh, not necessary with usability. Yes, uh, the, the question is absolutely meaningful. And uh, uh, this highlights the, the importance of, uh, uh, of language, right? Actually, when we say simulating user behaviors, uh, we meant a different thing. We meant the importance during an audit to interact with the page. So just analyze statically a page might not be enough because there might be issues that could arise when I try to interact with the main navigation bar or a, a drop down. So the importance of uh, using the page uh, to like we, we were a, a real user. That was the meaning of simulating user behaviors. And I hope that this makes sense. Uh, Ray asks uh, a couple of great questions. I start with the first one. Reading the, w the WCAG, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, can be overwhelming as they are complex. Uh, what are some techniques uh, you have seen done to simplify um, how the guidelines are presented to make things easier for those performing accessibility audits? Such a great question. Um, I start with a completely useless <laughs> answer. Uh, it has been 20 plus years that we work on accessibility and we still learn every day. And uh, uh, yeah, are, are complex. Uh, I think that the, I mean, the, the techniques is make sure that uh, at least uh, some of your auditors 
are also uh, experts in web technology, so have a development background. Uh, that, that helps a lot, just creating that understanding around the whys. So why something is an issue and what could be the solution. Uh, the complexity of the web content accessibility guideline is also related to the fact that, that they are quite old. Uh, they might not be very relevant for the technology that we use. So uh, it's kind of, you have to deal with it. Um, and if the uh, goal of the audit you are conducting is to, uh, as I assume, is to report uh, issues across the entireness of the guideline, it is, it is what it is, unfortunately. Um, I, I would like to see if Giacomo has uh, any, any input as this is really his, uh, uh, his core focus. Yes, um, as as Michele mentioned, the 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 audit phase uh, requires knowledge, knowledge uh, in terms of standards. So the auditor needs to know the WCAG standards, and then it requires a a, a developer uh, background because. Um, in order to understand if the current solution, the current implementation is affecting accessibility, may require technical knowledge. Um, if you think about the example we previously seen and reviewed together, the, the label was visually present, the quantity label was there, but it was not properly um, associated to its corresponding input. So from a technical point of view, and then it was reflected using Joe's, the, the input didn't have an accessible name and was not uh, understandable by people that are using this, uh, this assistive technology. Thank, Thank you, you, Giacomo. Uh, Ray posted another, uh, another question. Our team has used tool to provide an accessibility score but we know that that is not complete. What advice uh, would you give to help companies benchmark um, where they are on accessibility and what gaps they need, what gaps they need to fix? Yeah, another great great question, uh, Ray. The, the problem with accessibility at the moment is that it, it relates to a conformance which is a binary measure. So you are conforming the guideline or you are not. So it is one or zero. There is no middle, middle way, right? So, and consider that because of the way it is structured, you have to guarantee that something, a single success criterion is satisfied across the entire site. And this highlights one of the biggest gap, right, that we have trying to measure accessibility, which is uh, if I don't have a proper alternative for an image on my site, I am failing. Uh, I, I can. I, I need to trigger a failure of the first success criterion one dot one dot one. I need to mark the success criterion 1.1.1 if just one of my 1000 images on the website are not satisfied. And I will do the same if 999 images are not satisfying the same success criterion. So here we see how weak is just relying on conformance because I will lose that percentage because only of the of that one image in, in usable net we, we try to use like an, a very empirical measure trying to um, define what's the distance between where you are and satisfying that uh, that criterion that's a let's say a more delivery oriented measure uh, that seems like a score that maybe makes sense. 
in terms of benchmarking, that, that's also another another good point. And um, it is, I mean, ways we are helping company is, I mean, beside what I already said, is working a lot on comparing audits or tests over time. So showing the, the progress over time, which also includes as part of the equation, comparing um, user testing sessions. So sessions that are more focused on uh, involving the disabled community to execute specific tasks and see what is the behavior or uh, other parameters that you can measure uh, during a user testing are evolving over time. Um, another, another, and I hope I, I answer your, your question. Uh, another question is, do you consider a browser plugin a scanning tool as automated or semi-automated? Uh, yeah, I mean, there, there are many, there are, uh, and they are very popular. We, we have built ours, which is uh, connected to our usable net aqua platform. Um, I, I like the idea of, uh, uh, of course, using a plugin that uh, facilitates a lot, in particular, the development or, or content team, mm, let's say, initial scan. But it, the, I'm trying to use it, the right word, but honesty and understanding of the potential of that tool is key. So the, you can get the best result when you know exactly what, how much that plugin can give you in terms of the overall accessibility needs. You know that, that that's a portion. That's great, for example, to build a, a program trying to mitigate the legal risk. That could be, let's make sure that the majority of our pages don't have any issues that can be identified automatically. Uh, but do not just rely on it. So, but we, we agree that they are excellent tools when it comes to do a check while you work or before uh, committing the, the code to a, another environment. Also, uh, consider uh, tools or solutions that are allowing you to add tests uh, as part of your deployment pipeline. There are tools that can be called using APIs and you can better integrate them in the deployment process. So you can have at least a, let's say, high level, let's call it, call it in this way, check before you promote your code across your environments. Um, another question, uh, are there special considerations um, required when reviewing mobile applications? Such a great question. Um, I start saying that if we just think about the potential that we have on uh, uh, the web technologies, so the web code in terms of making a website accessible, they are on another level compared to the I mean, smaller number of um, things that you can control on a native app. This means that the one of the biggest driver when it comes to accessibility of a native app is the user experience and user interface. What we could, could go under the, let's say, design umbrella, I know I'm not very precise saying this, is a big, big driver for accessibility. Then at code level, you have, of course, aspects uh, defining accessible names of components and uh, defining reading orders that are, that of course you can do. But there is mm, less, let's say, that you can do uh, working on code than um, on, on web. So, on the native apps, uh, our recommendation is to rely on the tools that are 
automated tools that are already offered by the main platforms, so like the accessibility scanner uh, or the accessibility inspector, and then uh, manual testing activities. And then, uh, I mean, and I don't want probably to, to this would, would be very complicated and would require an entire session. And then there are a lot of differences between uh, fully native applications and applications that just include a, a wrapper. So that, let's say, present uh, web content through a, a, a wrapper. Uh, because the, the behavior and the way this uh, application interacts with the um, assistive technology, such as a screen reader, uh, natively installed on your devices, are very different. Um, how do you respond to clients who wonder why you need an audit um, when you just could put a JavaScript overlay like accessibility uh, user way on their site? Uh, yeah, um, that's another uh, great question. Um, the probably I would go back to the original uh, uh, slides and the first questions that we got from Ray. Accessibility is complex and requires a deep, let's say, manual, human-based activity. The overlays are, are meant to provide a, a probably a superficial resolution. They are good in addressing few points but when few items but when it comes to um to identify a, a solution to make something uh conforming with the guideline uh that is where probably their their gaps are, are more evident in particular uh and again this is our opinion that have been doing this this job for uh, for two decades also is that often overlays and solutions uh, based on widgets are trying to provide the users or keep users with alternative ways to, to do what they already do. There are solutions that are also allowing you to activate a screen reader, but blind users wants to use their screen readers, the ones that took so many hours to learn not to use another screen readers they don't know how to interact with. Um, there are widgets allowing you to change the color palette or the uh, color uh, scheme. But now all of our systems already includes into the basic settings the way to adapt the, your, uh, your screen to better present the information based on your uh, visual deficit. So often the settings that are just on that website provided by the widgets might be in collision with the settings that you uh, you define on your system. So as you probably already understood from our words, we are probably a little bit old school and uh, we, we want to, to, to resolve the root of the issue. Yeah, it takes time. It is more complex. It takes more money, uh, but that's the only way you can really do accessibility, in our opinion. And 10 years ago, we were using, I mean, not exactly similar technologies, but we were offering, um, in, in uh, let's say, together with our um, platform to perform the accessibility remediation that was, I mean, implemented by developers, the remediation was not automatically. Uh, but we were providing tools like uh, increase the text size or change the colors. We, we remove it because it's no longer needed. Um, how much time on average do you use for a web page audit, a single URL? Um, something, I mean, anything between uh, four and 10 hours depends on the complexity of the page. And for a native apps, uh, we are more or less uh, around the same uh, the same uh, thresholds. So 
I would say within the, the eight hours for a for a mobile app uh, audit. Also consider that for a mobile app, there isn't a real solid guideline because you need to apply the web content accessibility guideline, which is has been designed for web, not for native apps. So you need to rely on the official interpretation of the web content accessibility guideline on how to apply it to native apps. Plus, we implemented a set of, of guidelines to facilitate the auditing process internally. Um, how to manage third party apps uh, if they are not com uh, compliant uh, with WCAG? Yeah, that's a, another great question. Um, it, it might not be a great answer, but let's start from the contracts. So let's start asking uh, for a VPAT, for example, asking for reassurance from your third parties on the quality from an accessibility point of view of what they produce, because ultimately it will be your responsibility when you publish it on your website. Um, other uh, ways is potentially inform your users in your accessibility statement page that there might be uh, challenges because of the adoption of certain, uh, certain widgets or third party uh, components. It will not resolve the issue, but at least uh, it will facilitate the understanding of what's, what happens uh, when uh, a user might find difficulties uh, using your, your website. Um, then there is a question on uh, around the coverage of an automated test. Uh, you mentioned only 5% of accessibility success criteria can be fully detected with automated testing. Which tools do you use for automated testing? How many WCAG uh, success criteria can be potentially detected by automated testing? Um, we were using the most popular that you popular tools that you can consider. We decided to implement our technology. Uh, that decision was mainly dictated because we needed to support our auditing team with uh, uh, with a much more much more robust platform, in particular to uh, in performing uh, generating reports. And then we, we also develop all, a, 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 all the automation part. Um, just to complete, let's say, the, the context settings around that 5%, 5% can are the success criteria that can be tested completely automatically. So the automated test is fulfilling the techniques that you need to apply in order to verify whether something is an issue or not. There are another 20-25% that can partially be tested automatically, and then you might need to do a manual intervention in order to verify. For example, all the aspects of the guideline which relates to the meaningfulness of something. So the automated check can spot if an attribute is present or not, and then a human being is going to define whether that for example, alternative text for an image is meaningful or not. So, so just to add something here, if we think about the 111 success criterion, um, for example, a missing alt attribute can be detected automatically. So the 111 is semi-automated, but as Pichele said, the meaningful alternative text must be evaluated manually. So the same criterion, might be tested partially automatically and partially manually. Thanks, Giacomo. Uh, there are many other answers, um, and uh, I, I I would like to answer all of them. Uh, maybe Malcolm, you can help me uh, saving them, and uh, and I'm happy to to answer in writing. Um, I show before uh, our contacts, and that's also my, my personal email. Feel free to reach out for uh, for any additional question or or doubt you, you may have. I hope that this was useful. Uh, was deep enough showing 
what as a company or as an auditor you should either expect or provide your customers. And thanks uh, to the IAAP for the opportunity and thanks to um, everyone that uh, provided some, the support to uh, organize this session. This is Malcolm. I want to thank uh, Mikel and Giacomo for such a great presentation. Uh, like you mentioned, there's still a lot of questions in the chat, but I'll be saving that and sending a copy over as well. And Mikel's email and the link to the um, usable net website was posted in the chat as well. And we'll be following up with a post webinar email to everyone who registered with a copy of the presentation slides and the recording. So I want, once again, I wanna thank our presenters for such a great presentation today and our support team for their lovely work with the sign language and captions. For upcoming IAAP webinars and events, we have on the 13th and 14th of June, the IAAP EU hybrid accessibility event, and that's going to be online as well as on site. And then we have on June 21st as part of our digital accessibility series, ensuring your secure digital assets are accessible and on the 27th of June, embracing the ethos of accessible built environments in emerging economies, stepping it up, and that is part of our built environment webinar series. And just a quick reminder for anyone that is not yet a member of IAAP, we invite you to join a network of over 5,500 accessibility professionals in over 100 countries and IAAP members get discounts on live webinars and complimentary access to our library of over 100 archived webinars and our connections networking platform as well. Anyone interested in a membership can sign up at www.accessibilityassociation.org or email info at accessibilityassociation.org to see how you can become a member. Once again, thank you very much for joining us and I hope you have a great rest of your day.